How do we overcome oppression or injustice? There is this narrative that suggests that if we want to get rid of a bad society, we need to get rid of bad people. Within an unjust or oppressive society, the common target therefore becomes the elite that oppresses the others. Certain people just have too much power and money, and it is these people society needs to be freed from. There are similar narratives in regards to getting rid of sexism and racism. Overcoming sexism implies freeing society from sexist people. Overcoming racism means overcoming bigotry, or in other words, overcoming the racist dispositions of racist people. While such narratives might be tempting, they also have their limitations. Behind them lies the idea that social conditions are the result of individual intentions and actions. Sociologist Charles Tilley calls narratives such as these standard stories. Tilley writes, quote, To construct a standard story, start with a limited number of interacting characters, individual or collective. Treat your characters as independent, conscious and self-motivated. Make all their significant actions occur as consequences of their own deliberations or impulses. Limit the time and space within which your characters interact. With the possible exception of externally generated accidents, you can call them chance or acts of God, make sure everything that happens results directly from your character's actions. While explicit and implicit biases clearly exist, Standard stories have a tendency to obscure the systemic dimension of things such as racism and sexism. Standard stories furthermore diffuse from the complexity of structural oppression when such stories always shift responsibility towards single individuals. But what do we exactly mean when we talk about something being systemic or structural? Well, that is precisely the question I want to answer in this video. The theoretical conceptions I'm going to utilize are based on Sally Haslinger's work on social structures. So now let's take a look at the meaning of structural oppression. Try to imagine the following scenario. Uh, somebody, a random person, is walking their dog. Let's say this dog is quite lazy and our fictional person wants to condition the dog to run for a tennis ball. To do that, they hide a little treat within the ball and then throw the ball. Since the dog wants the treat, it now runs for the ball. So far, so good. I want to draw attention to a certain aspect within this example, which is the physical causations of the flight of the treat. And the key question I want to ask here is, why did the treat end up where it was and not at a different spot on the ground? And I'm not talking about the ball, I'm talking about the treat. To answer this question, we could measure out exactly where the treat was thrown and the force that was used and how it drifted into the air and where it landed afterwards. But the thing is, this explanation is very unsatisfying. But why is that? The problem is that any explanation as to why the treat landed where it landed is incomplete unless it refers to the tennis ball it was put in. The tennis ball is the significant causal point of reference to explain the flight of the treat. Or in other words, the flight of the treat was constrained by the tennis ball. But how does this relate to the question of this video? Social philosopher Sally Haslinger says that such constraints are the defining features of structural explanations. But before we further examine such explanations, there is the underlying question as to what exactly is a structure. Hesslinger borrows her conception of structures from philosopher Stuart Shapiro, whose main emphasis lies within the philosophy of mathematics. To understand his definition of structures, let's imagine two systems, system A and system B. Now, let's furthermore say that both systems share the same amount and the same kind of objects. So, in this respect, they are both similar systems. Despite that, though, the systems can still have different structures. Shapiro says that the structure of a system is defined by the relations of objects within it. So while system A and B share the same amount and kinds of objects, these objects have different relations to one another. So if structures are defined by the relations of objects within systems, 
we can conclude that social structures are defined by the relations of objects within social systems. But this requires further examination. For that, let's consider another example. Imagine a couple, Lisa and Larry. Lisa and Larry consider themselves to be against patriarchy and they both want to support a feminist cause. Because of their beliefs, they also have equal decision-making power within the relationship. They also share similar capabilities in regards to being able to do domestic work and raise children. Now, at some point, they have a baby. Now, imagine that they find themselves in a situation where decent childcare is beyond their means. In addition to that, there is a wage gap within their community, whereas women, on average, only make 70% of what men earn. Despite their progressive beliefs, it is most sensible for them to have Larry work and have Lisa do the domestic work in regards to this context and the need to provide decent childcare for their baby. The cause for their behavior doesn't lie within personal attitudes or beliefs. It is structural. Hesslinger says that within structures, individuals are merely occupiers of positions. Hesslinger also calls these positions nodes. Occupying a node means that one can only act within the constraints that are determined by the set of relations that make up the structure of which the node is a part of. She writes, quote, So it appears that structures are important to explanation because they constrain behavior of individual things in so far as they occupy nodes in the structure. The structure does not simply provide background conditions for the events in question, for it is the workings of the structure that are sometimes the proper object explanation. That means that individual intentions and actions become less relevant in regards to the fact that individuals can only act within the limitations of the nodes therein. This also applies to people that hold positions of power. Within an individualist critique of capitalism, the problem often is that certain people hold too much power and abuse it. This can then lead to a way of thinking where the solutions are to change capitalism by getting rid of the greedy capitalists. Within a systemic critique instead, the problem becomes the distribution of power itself, which is determined by structural relations. Structural oppression then occurs because of an unjust structural distribution of power. Hesslinger notes that this type of oppression can be very much happening without an actual oppressor. Just like we've seen with Larry and Lisa, certain groups of people can, in theory at least, very much be systemically oppressed by certain structural factors, such as laws, even if the privileged people of the same community do not intentionally want to oppress them. This doesn't ignore the fact that people that find themselves in positions of power will have the tendency to wanting to not lose their privilege. But if we want meaningful change to happen, the simple narrative of the greedy capitalists being the problem might actually obscure the problems more than it actually understands them. Instead, understanding how structures of oppression work and are systemically related should be the key objective for changing such structures. Sally Hesslinger writes, quote, Focusing entirely on individuals and their wrongdoings can prevent one from noticing that social power, the power typically abused in oppressive settings, is relational. It depends on the institutions and practices that structure our relationships to one another. When structures distribute power unjustly, the illegitimate imbalance of power becomes the issue rather than an individual abuse of power per se. But this is not the only way in which structures can constrain individual behavior. We have seen how structures are social relations within which individuals are nodes in the way that their structural relations limit the possibilities for social agency. Hesslinger now furthermore says that structures are constituted by what she calls social practices. Within social practices, we regularly reproduce our daily social life based on the particular social meanings we hold. Hesslinger also calls the social meanings behind social practices cultural schemas. They are the background of values that have significance within a particular culture and revolve around what Hesslinger calls resources. Resources are what is considered valuable by the social meanings or cultural schemas. Here's an example. In our culture, knowledge is seen as valuable. Knowledge is therefore what Hesslinger would call a resource. We have all kinds of social meanings attached to this resource. Within social practices, we organize these resources. 
Schools, for example, are institutions in which we perform social practices such as teaching and learning that revolve around the resource knowledge. Different social practices relate individuals within broader networks of practices that form structures. The practice of learning in schools, for example, is related to other practices such as being woken up by parents at a certain time and having breakfast with them, which is connected to other meanings and practices that revolve around certain resources. The civil family, for example, is based on certain social meanings that involve certain ideals of romantic relationships. Hesslinger now argues that these social meanings are another aspect of structural constraints. Let's, for example, consider sexism and the objectification of women, which, if you're interested, I've made a video about. Men are socialized into certain social meanings within which it is desirable to seduce women. But even in a broader sense, women are objectified within Western cultural schemas. These social meanings are part of a certain culture. They are constantly enforced and internalized within families, friends, and media. Again, we are dealing with a systemic issue that we cannot fix by holding responsible a few sexist individuals. Doing that merely scratches the surface of the problem and tries to fix it by eradicating the symptoms of a deeper issue. To really overcome the problem, we will have to overcome the structural and the social meanings into which these individuals are socialized. Being socialized into certain social meanings, people often don't really have a choice. Hesslinger writes, in general, words and actions have meanings that go beyond the agent's intentions. In spite of the possibility of change and contestation, the effects of social meaning are in an important way non-optional. They empower or constrain individuals whether or not the individual chooses the power or constraints. Buying a BMW has a different meaning from buying a Ford, whether the consumer intends it or not. This can be illustrated by the social meanings of racial stigmas that American philosopher Elizabeth Anderson describes. One late night in 2007, I was driving in Detroit when my oil light came on. I pulled into the nearest gas station to investigate the problem when a young black man approached me to offer help. Don't worry, I'm not here to rob you, he said, holding up his hands, palms flat at face level, gesturing his innocence. Do you need some help with your car? This encounter illustrates the public standing of racial stereotypes as default images that influence the interactions of black and white strangers in unstructured settings, even when both parties are prepared to disavow them. A little ritual must be performed to confirm that both parties do disavow the stigma so that cooperative interaction may proceed. This story exemplifies the impact of social meanings that are part of certain structures despite the individual intentions of individuals within these structures. Let us now consider what Hesslinger calls resources, as things taken to have value or disvalue within a society. Resources are not evenly distributed. In my video about the idea of meritocracy, I talked about sociologist Pierre Bourdieu and his conception of forms of capital which are unevenly distributed within capitalist societies. This unequal distribution of resources, such as money or knowledge, can also help explain structural racism. Just take a look at this table that shows the median household income of black and white communities within the US. Such uneven distribution of resources reinforces racist structures. A person with a lower income faces constraints that people with a higher income won't experience. Structures that reinforce such uneven distribution of income therefore situate certain individuals within what Hasslinger calls a node that comes with a certain set of limitations. But like I've said before, it is not only the oppressed that are situated within such nodes. The greedy capitalists, for example, aren't really the evil exceptions within an otherwise good world. Their actions are the result of the principle of a market in which permanent growth is required. These people are simply following this particular logic. Furthermore, the values behind that logic are ingrained in all of us, and they are part of the cultural schemas that we all share. If we want actual and meaningful change to happen, it won't happen by getting rid of the bigots and racists in the world. In fact, a moral individualism that solely shifts the responsibility towards a certain group of people might actually distract from the actual systemic dimensions of the problems we are facing and therefore becomes ideological. If we want actual change to happen, instead it is the structures we need to illuminate, understand and overcome. <laughs>